folks. Uh, I think we'll go ahead and get uh, started. I uh, appreciate you all coming out tonight. Uh, it's kind of a, a small group of us. I, I heard a story uh, once uh, that was an evening service, and uh, the minister showed up, and there was only one other person that came, and it was a uh, old rancher. And the guy, the minister was a little embarrassed. He said, well, I really don't know if I want to give my whole sermon here or, or, or not. And the rancher said, you know, if I went out to feed my cattle and only one showed up, I'd still feed it. And uh, the minister was chastised. He said, well, it makes sense, so I'll go ahead and do it. So 40 minutes later, he finished his sermon. And he uh, asked the rancher, well, what do you think? And he says, you know, I said I'd feed the cattle, I wouldn't empty the whole truck. <laughs> well, tonight you guys are going to get the whole truck. Uh, it's just, uh, uh, so, uh, you know, I know a good part of you. My name's Tim Powell. I'm the uh, medical director uh, and uh, the CEO of Evergreen Family Medicine. And over here is Ashley Miller, and she's our quality specialist. Kind of a unusual topic tonight, and I had no idea what appeal this may or may not have for folks. And uh, again, I, I appreciate that it's an important topic to me. Uh, I practice medicine now for about 40 years, and uh, I, I, I tell people up until the first of the year I did real work, and now I'm just in management. Uh, but uh, that focus on processes and quality means a lot more to the patient experience than you might think. Any of you that have worked in healthcare will, will understand some of this. So I, I'd like to have some fun tonight. I hope you can. It's just a, a few of us. Uh, and I want us uh, also to hopefully have a better understanding maybe of how a large medical clinic evaluates the quality of care uh, they, they uh, deliver. And I, what I'd like you to understand a little bit is just how much work is accomplished behind the scene under the surface of what most people think about when they come to a, a clinic for care. And you'll appreciate a little bit what Ashley does uh, uh, in that, that type of a setting. So let me just start uh, beginning uh, some questions. So uh, you're a patient. Uh, you just uh, moved to a new town. Uh, let me ask you, how do you decide where you're going to go for your medical care? Yes. Any thoughts? Pray a lot. Well, pray, pray helps. <laughs> Go ahead. Friends. We just moved back to this area uh, in last May, so I've been doing it. Um, we, but because my husband is employed at Mercy and Evergreen was affiliated with Mercy, that's where I started. Yeah. Sometimes there are those associations that uh, kind of help uh, a little bit. If you come and you're not at all medically connected, it's a little bit of a stone in the pool, you know, isn't it? Uh, any other thoughts that folks have, how, how you might uh, choose where you would go? Ask a nurse. A lot of ask a nurse. Uh, ask a nurse. And uh, I will tell you, that's a perfect way. Yeah, ask uh, people, especially to have to work with physicians, and uh, uh, kind of they have a behind the scenes uh, look. Uh, and so that's a, a reasonable uh, way. Uh, a lot of times you just ask around for recommendations uh, as well. Uh, some people more and more now go on social media. Uh, I'm not a big social media person. It's just wrong generation, but they do. They go on Yelp or uh, Health Graves or you know one of those and kind of uh, look. But you usually see there's the most disgruntled folks. But no matter whether it's a plywood store or a, uh, whatever else you know that, that uh, you see. Uh, when I first came to town, a lot of people would call the medical society and, and ask. Uh, and you might think, you know, that's a good way, a professional society, that ought to be uh, helpful. But behind the scenes, what happened, and I, I just knew that because I was part of the medical society, they didn't want to show any kind of papertism or anything, so they just went down the list. You'd do just as well going to the yellow pages, you know, and look. So it wasn't a recommendation with any particular merit, but just who was next up in the rotation, depending on. Uh, and of course, the old trial and error period, you go in and uh, try them out and say, well, that doesn't work for me. <laughs> and, uh, and that's kind of painful uh, sometimes. Well, okay. So it's, it's a little hard, but maybe uh, you need to start with this focus. What's important to you after you get there? 
after you get to a place, now you're trying to decide, am I getting good care or not? And, and honestly, sometimes uh, people come with a specific uh, need, but also a specific idea of how that idea should be treated. And uh, sometimes um, uh, not getting what you want is a good thing. Uh, if you come in for an operation you don't need and walk out without it, you're, you're ahead. Uh, but uh, again, when you go uh, to your office and experience there, uh, what's, uh, what's important to you? Are you saying, are you asking what's important from the doctor? Oh, no, I, I'm asking you, Linda, as a patient, and you're wanting to know, am I happy with this? Am I feeling confident? Uh, am I feeling like my family's needs are going to be really provided for? And I'm not talking about just the physician. I'm talking about the whole experience. And you could also talk about the hospital in that setting, you know, because you worked a career at the hospital, you know. But uh, there's, a, there's an aura and there's an overlying umbrella of a ton of stuff uh, that comes in to uh, make up your experience uh, and your confidence that, that you're getting uh, either uh, what you need or, or not. And so I'm just asking you to kind of think within yourself, because here's the deal, I'm trying to get you interested a little bit in, in uh, um, the question I ask myself and what we, how do you know if you're doing a good job? You know, as a clinic, you know, we have between 30 and 40 physicians now, we do a ton of different stuff, and we hope it's good stuff, and we hope we're uh, really making a difference in people's lives. How do you measure that? And what are you looking for? You know, uh, that's what I'm asking for. So from a patient's perspective, and, and your perspective is going to be different from mine, because I, I look at, if you know, quality improvement or different things uh, from a uh, uh, professional standpoint will be different from the patient experience. But I still, even if you don't answer me right now, I want you to start thinking, uh, what do you need? What, what do you want out of that uh, clinic? Not just the encounter, the single one, because everybody has good days and bad days, uh, but the consistent overall uh, feeling. Uh, I will tell you what, as I have talked with people, first and foremost, uh, people want quality. Uh, but you know, that's a big word. It means a lot of things, it means different things to different people. But, but they want good care. And, and they want to know that it's evidence-based uh, and, and they, want, uh, they want quality. The second thing they want is simply access. They want availability and access. Uh, you can have the best doc, in the world, and if you can't get in, uh, it, it's not some, the help. Uh, I, I put the word uh, patient satisfaction there, and, and that really encompasses uh, uh, a ton of stuff because it encompasses the front office staff as well. Who answers the uh, the uh, phone if the bathrooms are clean, you know, and uh, just the whole process. How do things work after hours? Uh, you know, just a, a ton of stuff comes into. Uh, patient satisfaction, and a person can end up treating somebody, and they can do all the right things, and a patient can walk out of there unhappy. You know, I, I will tell you that's that's the, the truth. Uh, and mechanically, you look at the note, and, and I've done this with uh, people I've referred to a specialist for a referral, maybe a neurologist or whatever, and they come back and say, man, that, that guy didn't do anything. I looked at the note, and he did a lot, actually, you know, and, and he could give me a lot of information, but somehow, uh, that wasn't conveyed to the patient. They didn't feel it. Uh, they, they didn't uh, feel it. Uh, and and this, the next thing I uh, put up there is efficiency. Now, efficiency means a lot of different things, but uh, just to give you uh, an example of, of what I mean, if you call in and, and you have a need. Maybe you have a wonder what that lab show, or maybe you uh, need a prescription refill, or you need an answer to the question or whatever. Well, if you get an answer two days later, and you know that that's not so hot. On the other hand, if you get an on-target answer to whatever that concern is with an hour or two, you say, "Wow, that that's kind of got its stuff to, uh, together." Um, I guarantee you, none of you have any ideas the onslaught of stuff that comes our way in any single uh, day. We have buckets. Now, buckets are little categories that um, of needs. It could be prescription refills. It could be a patient calls about my leg hurts. Uh, when am I going to get this referral? It could be 
question, my kid's got chicken pox, what do I do with it? Or I have these symptoms, where do I go? What specialist would you recommend for this? I, I don't know what to do with this, whatever it, it is. We have buckets of, of uh, questions. There is a, a particular, these kind of buckets I'm talking about are ones that have to be touched by a human. They have to be touched by one of my staff. Uh, and touched in terms of either type, or the, the referral, that process. Uh, if it's a uh, prescription refill, it be, you know, you go check, well, is that something wrong? Uh, is the dose right? It, all, all the different things, is it, it, are they due? And, and you know, all the different things you do. At Evergreen, we get over 25,000 buckets every week. In family and, and that's practice. Just, in family practice. That's just in family medicine. That's not urgent care and stuff. Uh, over 25,000. And so what I says is efficiency. Because you'll never see that efficiency, but you'll feel it if we don't do it well, uh, is, is the, uh, the point. Uh, you know, I, I, I put down there, you know, I'm, I'm asking what you're lo lo uh, looking for and where your needs met. I mean, you don't really care about my 25,000. That's my problem. You want to know where your needs met, you know. And, and uh, the fact that uh, today, I was, all day, I was in the hospital here because I'm, I'm a hospitalist for our group. This, and I was very busy over here. But if you came to see me in, uh, in my clinic, well, I wasn't there, so your needs weren't met. But they, after they would be met, if I had a system set up where you could be seen and taken care of uh, there. But it goes beyond where your needs met. How about the needs you weren't even aware of? How about the test or the vaccine or you know whatever else uh, that you needed? Maybe you needed a crot or duplex to uh, detect a, a stroke or something to do a cancer, uh, thyroid nodule, needs a biopsy. Whatever it was, uh, how about needs that you weren't even aware of? You know, so were your needs met? And then the last thing I put: Can you afford the care? You know, uh, can, can you afford it? Certainly, medical costs uh, are, 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 are huge. So, uh, there I go. And uh, now you have my job. That, that was your job, to tell me what was important to you. And, and I kind of did your job there a little bit for you. <laughs> uh, but uh, now you have my job. You're, you're the CEO. Uh, you have 30 to 40 providers working for you. You have about 200 employees. Uh, and how do you know? How well you're doing as a clinic? Uh, what questions would you ask? Uh, now you're the CEO. You're you're me. You got my job. How how do you know? Uh, well, uh, we're very lucky tonight. Uh, we have Ashley Miller. Uh, she is a quality expert, um, and so I'm going to be getting by ask, asking Ashley. Ashley, what is a quality specialist? And what I'm really saying is, what is it you do all day? So as a quality specialist, I monitor our quality metrics for various insurances, government quality programs, and our internal metrics. And a metric is um, an example I'll use is colonoscopies. So the metric is measuring how many of our patients who fall into the category where they need colonoscopies to screen for colon cancer, how many of those patients are getting those um, services complete. So that's a metric. That's what I get to look at. Um, I also coordinate our patient-centered primary care home program. We'll get into that in a minute. Um, I get to work with staff from all areas in family practice, um, which is, that's the privilege to get to see things from different areas. And we all work together to improve our processes and our workflows, and we work to make things better for patients and the staff. Um, so I get to do a lot of report reviewing and writing and projects and miscellaneous things. Um, and before we move on, I just wanted to clarify a couple terms. We use the term provider a lot, and that means um, that could be a, a physician, a doctor, or a, a mid-level, which is a nurse practitioner or a physician's assistant. So we say provider because it's kind of a neutral term. And then um, PCP stands for, um, sorry, stands for primary care provider, and so your primary care provider is the provider that you normally see when you go into the office. I deal with a lot of acronyms, so if I start talking about something and don't explain it, feel free to interrupt me. 
I will try to speak louder. Is that better? Okay. You know, when they ask uh, Ashley what you do all day, actually, she's very busy. I, I go into her office a lot because what I want are numbers. A lot of times, and you'll see some of these numbers I'm asking for, and I'll say, show me this, or I want you to investigate and, and bring me that back this information. Uh, we talk about uh, metrics. Metrics simply means to measure something. Uh, and, and if you're going to know uh, whether you're doing a good job or, or particularly uh, if you're getting better at something, uh, you, you need to start with a baseline. You need to measure where you're at and you need to uh, intervene and then you need to see if you're getting better at, at whatever it, uh, it is. Uh, you know, one thing, Ashley, when I think about uh, quality, uh, one method people look for is credentialing. Uh, like, uh, if you want to go to a family physician, you'd like to know, are they board certified? You know, are they board certified or an internist or gas or all that? Are they board certified? Because that's kind of a, an assumption of, of quality if you uh, do that. Is there anything like that for a clinic? Yes. For primary care offices, there's what's called the Patient-Centered Primary Care Home, or PC, PCH, certification program. Your handout um, is kind of what patients should look for in a patient-centered primary care home. Um, and, and it's a care delivery model that strives to improve the patient experience, better the health of our patient population, reduce the cost of health care, and increase provider and staff satisfaction. There's several standards um, that medical homes can work to attest to in order to achieve the recognition. And the six categories that all of those measures fall into are up here on the screen, being accessible, accountable, providing comprehensive care that's continuous and coordinated, and ultimately being patient and family-centered. And so quality of care is measured really across those um, six categories. And I believe that Evergreen has always taken good care of our patients, but when we kind of sat down and really started taking this certification seriously, um, we made a lot of changes and improvements for patients and staff. We were able to add a lot of services um, that not every primary care office is fortunate to have, and it's just better ways for us to meet our patients' needs. So there is a certification for a clinic, uh, and we have uh, one of the, the highest ratings with a PCPCH, but what that requires of us, there's this really thick book of measures that you have to do and have to be able to show, and then they come in and inspect you, and they say, show us how you're doing this, uh, whatever the measure is, as a, uh, a clinic. And so that's somewhat like a, a certification uh, for a uh, clinic. Uh, actually, there's other people that look at qualities as well. Uh, insurance companies and e even the uh, government uh, oftentimes will uh, speak about quality. And yet they don't deliver care, they just hopefully pay for it sometimes. Uh, how do they impact quality? So the federal government is actually working to shift from a volume-based payment system to a value-based payment system in the medical world. And so this means um, providers would get paid on how well they take care of their patients as opposed to how many patients they can see, quality over quantity. Um, and so to begin this process, Medicare um, has started paying providers for how well they do on quality metrics. Our local Oregon Health Plan Managed Care Organization, Umqua Health Alliance, does the same type of thing. Again, they're, they're paying for things like cancer screenings, controlling blood pressure and diabetes, and making sure our kiddos are up to date on vaccines. And then the Medicaid-based, excuse me, Medicare-based insurances add other age-related items like annual wellness visits. <coughs> What opportunities are, are there for actually uh, <coughs> pay patients uh, to give feedback? Uh, you know, we talked about some of the things that are important to uh, patients, but it, it would seem to me, you know, the insurance company honestly has such a poor understanding of what we do in the clinic most of the time, and a lot of other metrics I have found will we'll meet them, but they aren't that helpful. Uh, like a lot of government regulations, uh, they're something you have to do, but not something that actually allow you to do what you do better. Uh, but the uh, feedback from patients, I, I really take to heart. I mean, that's what grabs my attention in a hurry. 
so uh, what, what opportunities is there? So we do take our patient feedback very seriously. Um, we're pretty fortunate to have a, a system that allows us to send electronic surveys to patients if they give us their email address after they visit, um, after they have a visit, they get an email survey. And it has several questions. Um, this is kind of, if I log in and I want to look at last year's surveys, this is my dashboard. Um, and so they answer a variety of questions, um, score that, and then there's also a spot where they can leave um, comments. So, you know, free text and get to say whatever they'd like. So these surveys are reviewed each month for both positive and negative feedback. Um, and then we also take any formal complaints that we receive seriously, and those are reviewed by a committee. But my favorite <coughs> avenue for receiving feedback is our PFAC, or Patient and Family Advisory Council. These are our current members of our PFAC, and they're lovely people. And so a Patient and Family Advisory Council is a small group of patients. Um, in our practice, we decided to have the providers nominate patients, and they went through a short interview process, and then they agreed to meet with us on a monthly basis. And we, we asked them for feedback on lots of different things, but they're also free to bring up any concerns that they have or questions that they have. Um, and so we're actually looking to start another council down at our Myrtle Creek site, so we're working on that. And I'll just give one example of a change that we made as a result of this PFAC group. Um, we had kind of previously operated on the thought that when a provider is unfortunately leaving the clinic, um, patients wouldn't want to know about that until they could be given all of the information. So sometimes we'd wait a while and then we'd get the information and send a letter out. So our advisors said, no, actually patients want to know as much information as possible as soon as possible, even if you don't have all the answers. So um, last, at the end of last year, we had a physician who ended up moving out of state. Um, her husband had gotten the job, and so we didn't know when she was going to be leaving exactly. So we sent out one letter, and we let our patients know, you know, this, this provider is moving out of state, we're not sure when. Um, we'll send you a follow-up letter when we have more information. Here's what you can do in the meantime. You know, please contact the office as usual. We're not dropping you. Um, and then once we did have additional information, like a, a, an end date and their new primary care provider, we sent out that second letter. So that was really, that was a, a process change for us as a result of our advisors. You know, that was really counterintuitive for me, and it is not something I particularly like to do. Uh, Bob Dylan has a line in one of his uh, songs that says, uh, I'll know my song well before I start singing. And I really like to have all the facts together before I start talking with uh, people. But what the uh, patient council said, you know, we'd really like to know up front, as soon as there's going to be a change, even if you don't have all the answers, let us in on it. Yeah. And uh, it sometimes raises more questions. I was afraid it'd uh, increase anxiety, and, and then they want answers, and we can't give it to them yet. And, but this is what they asked for, and, and it seems to be working. So it, it uh, was not something I would have chosen to do without that, that input from, uh, from patients. Um, you know, Evergreen is the only uh, primary care group here in town that actually follows its own patients into the hospital. Uh, most people now turn that over to hospitalist uh, uh, service. Uh, but I will tell you the hospital environment uh, is an entirely different environment from the clinical environment. Uh, utterly uh, different in, in many ways and, and in terms of the things we would want to measure to answer the question, are we doing a good job? Are we doing a good job in the hospital? So actually, how do we look at that? How do we look at our uh, hospital work? So like Dr. Tim said, we are very fortunate and proud to be able to see our patients when they go into the hospital. We have a, a select group of physicians that rotate through a call schedule. So you might not get to see your PCP, but you'll see an evergreen physician while you're there. Um, and so we do get some quality reports from the hospital. The main metric that we look at is our hospital readmissions. So when a patient discharges, how soon are they coming back to the hospital? 
obviously we, we don't want them to come back to the hospital. And because we are that patient-centered primary care home, we were able to create uh, a few additional positions in our clinic to assist with our hospital services. So we have a community care coordinator who works with the patients and their families and the hospital physicians to assist with discharges. Um, she can help with you know, setting up testing or placement into a skilled facility, all sorts of things that can sometimes be pretty tricky uh, without her. And we also have two clinical staff members who reach out to patients after they've been discharged or seen in the ER. They give them a phone call, check in with them, go over medications, make sure you know they picked up new medications at the pharmacy, that they don't have questions, they're adhering to their treatment plan, um, and just kind of go that extra step to make sure that they're doing okay, and they also schedule their follow-up. And so we believe that do these two extra things that we do will hopefully reduce hospital readmissions. You'd be amazed what causes hospital readmissions. You think, oh, things really got worse or changed. That's the time that's not it. It's a drop that uh, somehow is often informational. Uh, and they went home and they really didn't get the correct med list or understand the med list or were able to afford the medicines or the updraft nebulizer or, or whatever it was. Uh, and a lot of times we have I'm a senior, so I can say that I'm 69, uh, and uh, we have a lot of seniors, and they're not medical, and so there's a, a lot of misunderstanding, uh, and they just want to get the heck out of the hospital and get home, and so the nurse comes in and says, do this and this, and, and they go home, but they don't have a, an absolute understanding of what their meds should be or what they should do. We have our own discharge planner now that just deals with every patient. She goes in there. Her name is Carol, she's sitting right in the back there, and she says, uh, Mrs. Smith, you're going home uh, today. Are you ready to go home? Do you have a ride? How are you going to get home? Here are your medicines. Do you understand those? Who's going to pick up these medicines for you? You have oxygen. Who, how are you going to get that oxygen there? You need a wheelchair. Where are you going? Uh, a lot of times the insurance gets in the way of that. She does all that so that when they go home, they're actually taken care of, and she tells them, uh, within 48 hours, you're going to get a call from somebody at Evergreen. Answer the phone, don't hang up, it's us. And, and we're just asking, how you do it? And then we go through the medicines again. Are you taking those? Is everything going right? And we make an appointment to see in a week or two. That, we call that transition of care. And that uh, eliminates a ton of readmissions that otherwise would uh, occur. There are some people that look preferentially at the emergency department for their care. They just end up going there. So we also have an evergreen lady uh, employed by us. Uh, we have a, a, a software so that if they come into the emergency room, and this is their third um, visit within the last year, or uh, they're back within a month of when they went in, as soon as they check in, it goes up on her little phone or software Bump down to the ER, she goes, there, what's the problem? You know, what, what are you dealing with here? And we're not trying to talk you out of seeing the emergency room, but they are trying to say to you, you know, we can see you over in Evergreen. We can see you today, and we know you. We have your record, and we avoid a lot of unnecessary cost and so forth if, if you can do that. And so that's another way of doing it. We also have uh, every month, all of us that do at Evergreen, uh, provide hospital care, we have a meeting. We talk about any process problems, but we also talk about specific cases. We're all physicians, we've all dealt with this, and, and anybody who's passed away, anybody who's been readmitted, any really complicated patients, we all sit there and talk about it to decide how could we do that better? What, what could we do it different? And we have all of our social service people in there, our nurse manager, all the other people in there as well, including Ashley, uh, to say, is there any processes we need to improve on so that we can uh, take it better care? I really think, um, I, here I am preaching, but uh, in family physician, what I signed up for was the whole the whole thing, and that means taking care of your patient when they're in the hospital as well. And um, I think we can do a better job in the hospitals, and it's not because we're smart, but it's because we have this uh, cohesive group we share information um, and we work together as a team. 
and I, and I think that uh, something that you'll never see when you walk in, but you'll feel it, uh, hopefully, with the uh, uh, results uh, there. Um, so it, it sounds like everybody else has a, a, a way of looking at us, uh, the PCPCH certification and Medicare and insurance companies and the hospital and patients. How about ourselves? How do we look at ourselves, uh, Ashley? And, and uh, do we get a chance to kind of say, this is what we think is important uh, as a clinic and as providers? So internally at Evergreen, we have a Quality Assurance Performance Improvement Committee, or QAPI. And again, that's team members from all across family practice. And so we do sit down and look at the metrics that everyone else is asking us to do. But we also take a look at those and see what would we like to improve on. And so each year, we typically pick three to five projects that we want to work on. And we come together and formulate a plan. We think about what objections um, or obstacles we could have. Um, and so we complete what's called a PDSA cycle. That stands for Plan, Do, Study, Act. And so we write up um, kind of a project plan for each of our projects. Um, and so we're able to kind of document how things went, where, where we had to tweak and adjust things. Um, where things went well and kind of track our results throughout the year. Um, and so that team is really kind of instrumental in, in the changes that we make. And this graph, um, one of our interesting projects last year on the QAPI committee, we have patients that um, are on chronic pain medications and we wanted to make sure that we were following the protocols that we had um, put forth for those patients. And unfortunately, we didn't have a way of tracking that in our system, in our electronic health record system. So the QAPI team sat together for a few meetings, and we talked things out, and we figured out a way in our system where we could document those things, things like last year in our drug screen um, or pain contract signed. So in January, again, we, we couldn't even identify where we were at. And throughout the year, um, by the end of the year, we were at 90% of our patients having the current documentation in their chart. And so it was something that we could easily identify where we were at, um, which patients we still needed documentation for, and that's that sort of thing. So that was one of our um, pretty intense projects for last year. Uh, one that we're working on this year, just to give you an example, is our dilated eye exams for our diabetic patients. Um, those are done not at our office, they're done at a specialist office, but we often don't get the reports. And so we're working with those offices and with our patients on a little bit more education on what those are um, and hoping to get more of those results so that we have them in our patient files. Let me make just a couple comments of what uh, Ashley was sharing there. And, and unless you just never watch TV or read a newspaper, uh, you'll realize that the whole issue of the opioid uh, crisis and chronic pain management is, is a huge issue. Uh, there's two sides of that. Uh, pain is real, and you've got to treat uh, pain. On the other hand, you don't want it diverted to the street, and you want to make sure it's not misused. You want to make sure uh, it's uh, used in a very appropriate way. Uh, when this came out, Evergreen did a ton of work establishing exactly the protocols that they wanted to stay well uh, within certainly the state guidelines, the CDC uh, guidelines, uh, and so forth. But after you do all those protocols, it, it's kind of worthless unless you're sure everybody's following the protocols. And, and so we need to measure. In order to, uh, to know if you're doing a good job or not, you need to look at it and measure. There's a lot of things we do. Everybody on chronic pain uh, needs to sign a contract that, that they've been aware of the material risk and, and also a, an agreement how we're going to work this. Uh, there's a, we need to have a random year in duck screen. We do uh, regular uh, mental health assessments with those uh, uh, people. There's just a, a number of things that, that we do. We think, well, we're doing all these, aren't we? And then we realize we don't know. And so this was to, to prove uh, that, we're, uh, that we're, we're doing that well. And, 
and uh, those things are important. The dilated eye exam, uh, diabetes is still the number one cause of uh, blindness in this country. And when I said talked about things you mean, realize you don't mean. You come in, you're diabetic, and we ask you, when was your last eye exam with an eye doctor? And sometimes you know, but then you say, well, it's been five years or whatever. And we say, you, you need to have that done. And so we communicate now with the eye doctors and say, Mr. Smith is going to come and we need you to let us know when he shows up so we can mark it off. Otherwise, we're going to keep hassling him until he gets in there uh, to get that done uh, because we're trying to look out uh, after him. And once again, this is something we've always done, but when we say, well, how well are you doing it? Uh, and we're going to measure that this year to, uh, to see. And you know, I'd like to go back to that one of those first slides, slide number two again. When I ask the question, what's important to you? Most of the uh, stuff we've been talking about is right up here. Actually, let me ask you uh, this. How do you measure access? So one way is we do monitor the number of patients that are assigned to a provider on a monthly basis, and we break down the patient information by age, insurance, and complexity of visits on a quarterly basis. So this lets us know if we're able to take incoming patients and which providers those patients should be assigned to. Um, so that's one way. And uh, how about uh, availability? And I guess when I'm thinking about uh, availability and access, can patients actually see their own provider, or at least their provider team? So our scheduling staff uh, works very hard to schedule patients with their PCP, their primary care provider. And if that primary care provider isn't available, they schedule within the PCP team. And so the team that I'm referring to is a group of providers that are located in the same physical area, usually two to three, sometimes four. Um, and so the, the providers and the nursing staff in that area, or as we call them, pods, they work together to take care of all of those patients assigned to those providers. And so with the, with the team model, like Dr. Sim kind of mentioned in the beginning, if your primary care provider isn't available that day, or they're on vacation for a week, or they're in the hospital, you're seen by your team. And so they're typically more familiar with you. Um, they have access to all of your records, and of course they can communicate if needed with your, your provider. Um, and so I actually get to run a report each month that shows how many of our visits the previous month were scheduled with the primary care provider or the team. And we've set a goal of 90% of our visits being scheduled within the team. And I'm happy to say that we've consistently met that goal for the last couple of years. You, know, you, you might think, no, uh, if I'm going to see Dr. Pally, my doctor, I want to make sure I see him every time. Well, you're going to strangle me. Uh, you know, it just doesn't work that way. This week, I was in the hospital all week seeing our people there. I can't be two places at once, and once in a while we take a vacation. So it's important to have a team, you know, that if that person's not there, the other people there that really know the patient, and there's a lot of intimate sharing. The pods all have meetings as well, too, to talk about patients and processes and so forth, that there's a, a plan for seeing that patient within uh, that, that team. I will tell you, I'm a, bit, a lot better physician within a system of care. I practiced soul medicine for about 18 years, but if I went down for whatever reason, everything stopped, and now it doesn't. There, there's a provision uh, for, for uh, doing uh, that. We have a concept, you know, of kind of a next available appointment or something uh, of, are, are people too crowded? Are, are they too full? You know, can people get in? Can you talk about that? So we do have a couple different uh, reports that we can run, kind of looking in the future. And we're able to see how, how soon can you get in with provider X versus provider A for this type of appointment. Um, and we can see how full the schedules are in the future. Um, you know, is a particular provider, for some reason, their patients can't get in for three months instead of one week. And so we're able to run those reports and kind of look at them and evaluate and see if we need to make some adjustments. You know, I appreciate your patience as we talk about this, because this isn't uh, like CPR or open heart surgery, you know, and yet the, it's these details <coughs> that really make the difference in, in quality and in what you uh, experience. There are certain diagnoses that uh, take a lot of time. 
uh, and especially when they're not controlled. It may be diabetes, it may be mental health issues, it can be addiction uh, medicine, or it could just be complex assortment of a bunch of stuff, especially in an elderly patient. Uh, how can you plan for those? Because what I'm saying is a patient is in a patient, here's patient A and here's patient A, and you say, well, okay, they got to take this amount of time, but they don't. So we're very fortunate at Evergreen. Um, we have Dr. Clyde, who's an endocrinologist, and Alicia Morrison. She's a nurse practitioner specializing in diabetes. And so all of our patients that need that extra specialist touch, they um, can see those too. And they're all within Evergreen. They're Evergreen providers. We also have Dr. Yates. He's a psychiatrist. And Dawn Brumfield, she is a licensed clinical social worker and she specializes in brief behavioral health interventions, things like coping skills and anxiety relief, a lot of just really good skills that she can teach to patients. And so we have a lot of patients under our care who benefit from having these providers embedded within our system at Evergreen. It's easy to get in for appointments and schedule, um, and, and the care coordination is, is better because we share the same record system. Again, if there's something that needs to be discussed, they can you know, walk across the building and, and have that discussion. And then kind of talking back again about our teams with the two to four providers, we intentionally set them up so that the, uh, the providers in that area have a range of experience. We usually have at least one physician and then some mid-levels, again, your nurse practitioners and your PAs and then we have people who've been in medicine for a while, and we have some of our newbies who just come out of school. And so they can balance each other and learn from each other. Um, they, they really, it, it's a team. I don't know how else to say it. It's a good team um, building on each other's skills. And if needed, if there's a really complex patient that a mid-level is just um, not unco uncomfortable with, per se, um, they could transfer them to the physician or someone else on the team. Actually, if, if you know, we, you showed us how we measure access and measure availability, uh, when you see, yeah, there is an access problem here, what can you do about it? Um, in our provider schedules, we do leave a few work-in slots each day reserved for urgent appointments. Um, one thing that we decided to do last year was move all of our annual wellness visits for our Medicare patients off of the provider schedule and onto a nurse's schedule, wellness nurse. And so this really freed up the provider schedules to see those problem-focused visits. And then we also last year began a walk-in well-child program. And that allows our pediatric patients to be seen for their routine well-child checks and vaccines without an appointment. And so Dr. Tim always challenges us to think outside the box. So when we notice problems, um, we kind of try and think of ways to solve them. With the walk-in well uh, child, um, our Oregon Health Plan patients, in particular, a lot of times are not organized folks. Uh, they may not wish they were, but they, they aren't. And so you set an appointment up, and guess what? They don't show. And um, Providers kind of put off because they have this empty slot that could have been used for somewhere else. People like Ashley and our GAP people are put off because the kiddo isn't getting the care they need in the immunization. And so I said to them, you know, I've been hearing this same lament for a good number of years. We're going to have to understand these folks aren't going to change. We have to change. Because if we give them an appointment for three months on Thursday at 2 o'clock, there's almost no chance they're going to show up. And so what we need to do is call Mrs. Smith and say, Mrs. Smith, Bobby's behind on his shots and stuff. We need you to bring him in. Okay, what time? No, just bring him in. Bring him in this week, and, and we'll just see him. It's just a, a walk-in. And it's a very pragmatic approach to, to uh, uh, getting that, uh, that done. How do you measure things like satisfaction? It, it, I, let me phrase this a different way. Let me phrase it a different way. I, I will tell you we've talked about patient satisfaction, but there's another side of that, and that's the staff satisfaction. Anybody who you've worked in a clinic or a hospital or about any place else, if the employees there aren't happy, the customer feels it. One way or another, it, it, it impacts performance. 
And so one of the things when I try to think about satisfaction and improving satisfaction, I'm talking about uh, I'm talking about employees uh, as well. How do you deal with that? So part of being a patient-centered primary care home again is trying to improve um, satisfaction for our staff. So we do a lot of in-house testing, um, excuse me, trainings. Um, for example, the community college a few years ago had to end their medical assistant training program. And so now we train in-house. Um, we train our employees so that they can work at the top of their licensure. So folks aren't bogged down by tasks that someone else can maybe do for them. Um, we've worked hard to become a Blue Zones approved workplace. And we often have managers who like to have conversations and discussions for their employees in their department. They um, bring them alongside and, and talk about how things are going and maybe what needs to change. And then overall in our company, we have an annual employee satisfaction survey. It has a lot of questions, um, but that is reviewed each year. Um, and I'm happy to say our scores are going up. We, we work hard in various committees, um, as I've kind of mentioned, with staff from all areas. And this lovely thing that I'm not expecting you to read is a diagram of all of our committees at Evergreen. Um, we, we have a lot. So all of the staff members are contributing, um, bringing, and we bring in our patient feedback and kind of Different staff from different areas combined with that patient feedback, we feel like we can kind of tackle our, our problems and become more efficient and just overall better. Um, yeah, uh, if he has time, he'll ask you actually how you're feeling. Can you go back just one? Uh, I, I, you won't begin to see all this, but I will tell you this is not just a flow of power hierarchy. This is a flow of communication. I don't know if you've ever worked in a job where you were there sweating away doing things and you suspect at least management had no idea of all the frustrations you dealt with where you were in your job or didn't care. And so at every level uh, at each pod we have committees that all flow up and in the center there is a board and that's a physician board. It's not a, a insurance board or a, a hospital board. It's, it's a physician board that takes all of these uh, and, and we try to allow a situation where the person closest to the problem can suggest a solution. Uh, and when people are working hard but they feel like people are working together and they feel like they're heard, that makes a huge, uh, huge difference. Also helps to feel like they're appreciated. Um, so uh, going on then, uh, we talked about needs met, including maybe needs that people didn't know that they had. Can you give an example of, uh, uh, of how that works, actually? Okay, so this is a, a list of additional services. We've, we've talked about a few of them already, so I'll touch on a few more. Um, we have a dementia support group that meets on a monthly basis for the caregivers and loved ones of patients with dementia. We just started a diabetes support group. Um, for our patients who need a little extra TLC, we offer a service called chronic care management. And those patients get, um, they get to come in for a visit or a phone call with our, one of our nurses. Um, and it's just, like I said, extra TLC. We have a referral and prior authorization department and they work hard every day to set up your specialist appointments and make sure that medications and services are covered by your insurance. Established patients are welcome to come get select vaccines, testing, and other services provided by our triage and vaccine staff without needing to see a provider. We have a lot of different testing and procedures that can be done right in our office. And one thing that we're really focusing on this year is our community outreach events, um, something like this, for example. But last year, we hosted our first SWAG night, and SWAG stands for Student Wellness and Games. It was held at our Myrtle Creek office, 
and we offered um, free adolescent welfare visits, vaccinations, and sports physicals to all the teens in that community, regardless of if they were evergreen patients or could normally afford that type of care. And we're really excited this summer, we're partnering with the Wildlife Safari, and we are gonna be hosting a community-wide wellness event for ages zero to 18. You know who is uh, tough to contact as adolescents and teenagers? Uh, uh, it's tough to get them to talk to you, and, and it's uh, tough to get them to come in. And yet there are some really important conversations and some immunizations and so forth that that, that group uh, needs. So we realize, once again, we're going to have to go to them. And so, for example, in South County, uh, I had us, uh, and Ashley uh, mainly uh, arranged this. Uh, so we contacted all the athletic directors of all the schools down there and said, look, it's August. Your kids are going to need sports physicals. We'll do them. We'll do them at our Myrtle Creek uh, Clinic. Just get them to uh, show up from Riddle and Days Creek and all those uh, folks. But we saw a ton of kids uh, down there, as you might have imagine and, and so we said how can we get more central uh, uh, county do that so we're going to do that at uh, the wildlife safari uh, on June 15th and uh, uh, we hope to have around we're projecting around 2,000 kids uh, there and so it's it, again you talk about efficiency you better have the system down or it'll be uh, but, well, one last thing. Uh, just how about the ability to afford care? Uh, uh, any comments on that? So we do work uh, with our patients to afford care. One thing we try and do is avoid unnecessary testing. Sometimes that can come down to a conversation with a patient um, who's requesting a particular test. Um, and we get to tell them why maybe that's not the best idea. We offer financial assistance and have a self-paid discount when available, and we're happy to work with our patients and set up payment plans if needed. We have an eligibility specialist who assists our patients in signing up for the Oregon Health Plan or determining eligibility for that. Um, and she also works to find other financial resources that might be available to the patients. We talk about the certification of a clinic, just like a board certification for a physician. A highly functioning, advanced uh, patient-centered home is intended to be uh, the first door you enter for whatever your uh, need is. It can be medical, it can be mental health, it can be addiction, uh, it can be lifestyle medicine, it can be senior transitions. And when I say that word I'm talking about, uh, where all of us bred to get to where we need to move into assisted living or something. There's two aspects to that care. There's, can I afford it in a practicality? And secondly, there's the emotional aspect of that. And most folks stay way beyond what they should uh, in an untenable uh, situation. I think quality, when we talk about that, it begins with caring enough uh, to want to know, uh, caring enough just to listen. And, and it starts there. And then you measure. And you need somebody like Ashley to, to help you measure, because you measure, you measure again. You do that plan, of, uh, just plan it out, and just do it, uh, and then just study the results, and just uh, uh, act again, uh, the, the, uh, and, and keep improving until you ratchet up, and hopefully you see that improvement that you're uh, measuring. You know, after 40 years, I will tell you I've understood that, we, uh, that medicine will not solve your problem. Uh, we won't make everybody happy, but we can keep trying to get better, and we will at every. So I, I thank you guys for uh, coming out tonight. It, it was uh, kind of a, a maybe a dull subject, although Ashley doesn't think it's dull. She, uh, <laughs> I, I, I love Ashley's uh, passion for this because uh, it really uh, takes that. And I will tell you, uh, crunching the numbers and figuring out how to measure and thing, and spending the time and processes, and then educating everybody so we're all working together and then measuring and giving them feedback uh, is incredibly important uh, if, if we're going to uh, be better better because we have limited resources uh, we have limited time and we better do it uh, well uh, so 